In your life, you deserve to be more, be more, do more, have more, and give more. And now the Becoming More podcast with Diana Kokoska. Things that I'm going to share with you today are not only things that I learned as a realtor and as a CEO, I want to share with you some of the things that we learned from our clients, taking them from 400000 to making over $4 million in commissions for having someone go from Oh, he was closing about 100, 110 closings, and last year closed over 4,000 homes. So all of these little techniques in that, and in the book, Becoming More, it's basically about how you train your brain, because 90% of our success is mindset. Welcome back to the Real Estate Rockstars podcast. I'm Shelby Johnson, and today I am here with... Diana Kokoska, a freaking legend in the real estate space. Diana was the CEO of Keller Williams Maps Coaching and Training for 13 years. She grew that business to a $500 million company and one of the largest and most profitable coaching enterprises in real estate history. Keller Williams has a reputation for being the number one training company in the world. We've all heard it. And Diana played a pivotal role in building that reputation. She also recently wrote a book called Becoming More. You can't get to better until you get to different, which launches on October 31st of this year, 2023. It dives into leadership models, systems to empower and inspire growth in others, and real life application. Diana, I'm so honored to be able to share some time with you today. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much. And legendary, that just means I'm old. (laughs) No, I, yeah, I was reading the information about you prior and I was just getting more and more excited to talk to you. And I was hoping that before we dive in, um, could you share a little bit about your background and some context on, you know, maybe some life experiences that shaped you into the person that you are? (laughs) Perfect. I I love that you asked that question because, see, I believe that if I can do it, anyone can do that as long as they have the proper guidance, right? When I started real estate, it was a man's world. Went to 12 offices before I found someone that would hire another woman. You know, they already had one woman. And uh, it was just a different world. Yet it kept me going, which the learning there is you keep going no matter what. And then, of course, once I found a broker, Shelby, I couldn't afford a babysitter. So I put my kids in the little red radio flyer wagon and out. We went, we just started knocking doors and I got to meet the people and I wanted to be their realtor of choice. Of course, those people helped me because I helped them. They gave me referrals. And that first year, I was blessed enough to sell 104 homes. And it was basically because I literally got to know the 100 people. It was just a hundred doors, but I got to know them, their kids' names, their dogs' names, uh, their dreams, their aspirations. And in the day, there were a lot of Tupperware parties going. And I thought, well, if they can sell Tupperware at a party, why can't I sell real estate at a party? So I started doing investment parties where they would have all of their neighbors over, some people from work, whatever, and have hors d'oeuvres and or dessert. And I would sit and teach about how to invest in real estate, whether it be your first home or your first rental home. It really didn't matter. Yet it was just about getting in front of more and more people, right? That's what it's always about. That's so incredible. 104 your first year. That is just ridiculously cool. And and from there, when over time did you become the CEO of the Keller Williams Maps coaching program? Like how did that go from 104 your first year into that position that you you held? Well, it had a crazy ride. My first year, I hired what was termed back then a secretary and everyone said, "You don't need a secretary in real estate." I said, yes, I did. I mean, I do. I I was out knocking doors. Somebody had to take care of all the other things. Of course, we didn't have email and that. She wrote thank you notes for me and would reach out to people and say, Diana asked me to give you a call. Later on, I went with a company, uh, Remax, great company. 
And uh, I started having somebody come in and help me because I had a surgery. It's my son. I didn't know what to call him. Yet, when I came back from surgery, I went, why don't you stick around and help buyers, right? We eventually called him a buyer agent, which then caught on to the industry. And it was always about doing something different, looking for something different, and then following the adaptive learning model, which is in my book, where you learn, you implement, you fail at it. You relearn a better way, you implement that way, you fail at it, and it just kept going round and round and round. So, Shelby, I guess you could say I failed my way to success. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, you failed your way to success. And did you have a very clear vision for Keller Williams Maps coaching and training? like from the beginning, or was this something that you failed into existence down the road? Like, how did that happen? Well, and you know what I realized is I failed to answer your complete question. So I'm glad you brought me back to that. So I am a demonstration of that model right now. And so we're going to pick right back up because I relearned. I got to finish that whole circle. I didn't go to Keller Williams, right? Uh, I was at Remax. Then I started my own company, did very well. The unfortunate part is I started believing my own press. I don't know if you've ever been impressed with yourself or not. Uh, I hate to admit it, yet it was a failure on my part. And I didn't watch my money. I hired someone that uh, took over the property management division that I had started. Of course, we had 72 houses, Shelby, and we were doing really well. I was doing great. I love cars. I had four cars, you know, I mean, everything was just smooth sailing until my accountant came back from a mission trip. He'd been on for three months and uh, he called me and he said, Diana, we got to meet. I go, well, okay, I got to drop the kids off at school. I'll be at the office. I'll meet you there. And he says, make it fast. And I go, what's going on? He goes, you're broke. I go, what? I got plenty of money. Well, we went back and reconstructed everything, Shelby. And what had happened was she had taken all the rent checks and put them in her own account, closing checks in her own account. Um, (laughs) She didn't mail the mortgage company checks. She did mail the checks to the seller. And because there was money in there, everything kept going for a while, right? That night, I went to the board meeting because I served on the board of directors for the realtors. And uh, I came out and my car was gone. And they called the police. And I'm going, no, 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 don't call the police. And they announced to everyone that... uh, My car was not stolen. It was repossessed. And with that, of course, the joke went around town that if you're going to go anywhere, don't ride with Diana Kokoska. You may not get home. So I had to overcome that. Plus, I had to pay all those people back. I mean, I became a fierce negotiator. I know how to negotiate with the best of them now after negotiating all those mortgage companies and banks, right? But I had 72 houses with three house payments each, plus my own house payment. Of course, I told you I had a lot of cars. I sold all the cars. I sold my four offices that I had. I got pennies on the dollar because everybody knew what I was going through, and I went back to sales. Well, from there, uh, doing fairly well, I then ended up at Keller Williams. One year as an agent, one year as a team leader, and then they asked me to go to international and to take over the MAPS coaching and training, which I love because I love helping people discover their greatness and taking a stand for their greatness because too many people stand for their limitations, right? And starting it up, of course, it was already losing money according to The president, Mary Tennant, at the time, she said it was losing about a million dollars a year. And to take that and to be able to build it into the $500 million company, to have 357 coaches uh, that were one-on-one coaching almost 5,000 agents. And then we had group coaches, 80 of them with over 10,000 agents. And of course, the 57 Bold coaches went out and trained and coached a program that I wrote called Bold Business Objective Alive by Design. 
And so things that I'm going to share with you today are not only things that I learned as a realtor and as a CEO, I want to share with you some of the things that we learned from our clients, taking them from 400000 to making over $4 million in commissions for having someone go from Oh, he was closing about 100, 110 closings, and last year closed over 4,000 homes. So all of these little techniques and that, and in the book, Becoming More, it's basically about how you train your brain because 90% of our success is mindset. Now, Cheryl Hemberg says that it's 95% is your subconscious mindset, and only 5% is your attitude. I like to say 90% is mindset and 10% is skill. Whatever it is, if you don't have the right mindset, you're not going to make it, right? A quick word on our toolbox. We know it can be overwhelming thinking about all of the systems you want to build into your business, and that is why we ask guests to submit their favorite checklist, template, or tracker so you don't have to build from the ground up. Go to realestaterockstarsnetwork.com and click Toolbox for your free access. Thanks so much. Absolutely. And Real quick, before we ju jump into the stories, which I'd love to hear, um, I think a lot of people could resonate with the part where you said that you were, you jumped into MAPS coaching and you took over a failing business at the time it was losing a million dollars. Is that correct? You said a million dollars a year. That's what I was told. Yes. Okay. And so I think, you know, a lot of people might resonate with the fact that maybe they're losing money and they're not sure what to do within their own companies. So when you took over, what is some advice that you would give for either entering a business that is losing money or you're looking at your financials and realizing that you are? What a great question. See, I believe there's a saying, you've got to live within while you live without. That means while everything is falling apart on the external world, your internal world has to be strong. It has to be one of belief, of faith, of trust, and to know that you're doing everything that you can to move forward and to make certain that people around you are positive people and never let any word or story come out of your mouth that you don't want to have C come to fruition. That's the only way that I believe you can take anything that is falling apart and put it back together, speaking only as if the story that you desire is actually happening right now. And people would, well, let's just say the president and the CEO of the company at that time, Mark and Mary, didn't use MAPS coaching. They had Johnny Johnson coaching. And they didn't want to use maps. So I literally started by calling 10 people and say, hey, look, I'm going to coach you for free for three months. And I just want to see what's going to happen to your business. And we'll have weekly calls. And then when your business goes up, you're going to have to help me to sell maps and how coaching works. That's how we started. I had one coach was left. Okay. I, I had to obviously prune as they call it, right? Prune the tree back a little bit. And uh, yeah, Sheree Lowry was the coach that I had kept and from there started building. Now, Sheree was a good coach and had a few clients. They were charging by the hour and I started charging per month. So it was the same amount every month. And adding some events to it. And it took some time. Those first three months were a little challenging because I was doing the work. Uh, and Cherie had her own paying client. As we got going, though, those 10 people, because no one succeeds alone, you got to have a hand that's open to give before you can ever receive something back, right? And I think sometimes people go, well, what can I give? you got to give your willpower, not, not pocketbook power. I, I didn't have money for power. I just had a willpower. And I started by saying, you know, I, I don't want to be rich. I, I just don't want to be poor. And so it started out very small. 
what can I do? What's one thing I can do today? And as I would coach those people, I would also be lead generating just like I did in real estate. Many people are where they are today, Shelby, because of their thinking. And they have built a cage that they live in, a cage that they believe is comfortable. Their thoughts are the bars of that cage and inside their comfort zone. And every single person, they have uphill dreams with downhill habits. We've got to get outside of our comfort zone. We've got to get outside of the negative habits that we have, primarily our talk and our self-talk, and get it into a more positive living within while we're living without. I hope that helps somebody. What if... I am living within bars that I don't even know are there. Like, what if, what do you say to someone who is unaware of the bars that they're, that are holding them back? It's a great question because we're all in a cage and we are unaware of our thoughts. In becomingmorebook.com, I talk about how attitude and mindset are different. And Think about this, Shelby. As a child, I was never told to have a positive mindset. I was told to have a positive attitude. I was told that my attitude made the difference, but I was never told my mindset made the difference. And I absolutely did not know that attitude is conscious mind and mindset is unconscious mind. And the bars are built by our unconscious mind, which means it's unconscious, right? So uh, when I started with the mindset thing, I literally Googled mindset and it had over 150 mindsets that I could find. And I went, that's too many. How does anybody know what mindset they're in? So I started literally listening to interviews with great people. I started, well, John Maxwell was my mentor, has been for 25 years. He did the foreword to my book. And I, I watched what, what did he say? What did he do? How did he think? And I started going, yep, he shows that mindset. Yes, he shows that one and that one. And pretty soon after studying a lot of great people, reading books, listening to podcasts, uh, hearing them speak at various events, I narrowed it down to seven mindsets that limit us and seven that liberate us. And we actually have an assessment when you pre-order the book, you get it for free. Now, you have to pre-order before October 31st, because November 1st, we're going to start charging for that mindset assessment. And yet, you're the only one that gets the report. You don't have to share it with anyone if you don't desire to. It will tell you what percentage of every one of those mindsets are limiting you and what percentage is liberating you. And we have both. All of us have both. It's like a coin. In in physics, they call it the law of duality. The law of duality says you have two opposites that combine together to make one thing. So you have heads and you have tails. You put it together, you've got a coin. It's you never get rid of tails and you never get rid of heads. It's just which one do you focus on? Now, a lot of people go, oh, I'm going to focus on an abundant mindset. And Shelby... They don't have a clue how to do that because it's unconscious. So I give five to seven steps on each one of these liberating mindsets. It's little things you can do every single day that will take you and start training your brain to go in the direction of a liberating mindset. Because we do train our brains. Every day we're training them. That hooked me so well. <laughs> I am dying to know what the, the seven mindsets are that limit us and the seven that liberate us. Um, so I'm definitely going to check that out after this. So while okay. looking at the chapters of your book, there was one chapter that jumped out at me. Um, several did, but specifically the one where you said values, what really matters. And I was hoping that maybe you could just give us some insight on what what that chapter is about and what you mean by that. Well, values dictate all of the decisions that we make. See, I can work with a lot of people that have different belief systems. I have a hard time working with people that have different values because values are what wars are started over, not beliefs. 
It's the values that you hold deep in your heart, right? It's those things that you would absolutely fight for. When you value family, you fight for family. When you value your faith, you fight for your faith. In fact, you want everybody to join it, right? When you have the value of achievement, you're going to do what it takes to achieve. Now, if you don't have the value of, uh, let's say, integrity and morals and the value of being honest, right? Uh, You may have the value of achievement and do whatever it takes to achieve, whether it's step on other people, uh, which you should be careful of because stepping on people on the way up, uh, sometimes you get to work under them on the way down, right? (laughs) So what are your values? One of the exercises that I did and put into the book because it helped me so much was I wrote down the five values that I really desired. And I had five in my personal life and five in business because business was about achievement. Whereas in my personal life, it was more about legacy that I left. And I wrote out the definition not the dictionary definition or Wikipedia's. I just wanted to absolutely know my definition. Then I wrote down where I used that value. And then the hard part came. Where did I not use that value that I wish I would have? And that's how I trained my brain to start looking for those areas that if those ever came up again, that I would demonstrate the values that were deep in my heart. The other part about values that is so very, very important, when you hire people, you you don't discard them because of their values, yet I would give them value cards and have them go through. And I'd have them a big stack of cards and they'd go through them and I would ask them to narrow it down to 10 cards of their values that were near and dear to them. Then out of those 10, I would have them go down to five. Now, it wasn't to eliminate them. It was to see, one, if they absolutely knew their values, and two, to know how I could best lead them with those values. Because as a leader, it's up to us to develop our people, empower our people, and help them become all they can be. So that values thing is is a big one. And I give a lot of examples, a lot of stories, and a lot of things you can do to make certain that you are living out the values that are important. Real quick, as you likely know, the 2024 Real Estate Rockstars Mastermind is sold out. But if one of your preferred vendors is looking for marketing opportunities, we are looking for sponsors. We would love to get their name and business out to 80 highly motivated real estate agents from across the country. Know someone who'd be interested? Go to realestaterockstarsnetwork.com and shoot us a quick email for more information. Thanks so much. Back to the show. You mentioned that as leaders, it's our responsibility to help people develop their values. Throughout your time as a leader, which has been a lot of time, um, have you ever struggled with wanting to identify the values or wanting um, the end result more than the people that you're leading? I think that as leaders, we see more than others see, we see further than others see, and we see before others see. And as a leader, I wanted to look for the potential inside of the person. And it's a potential that most people, Shelby, don't even know they have. So we've got to help bring that out in them, sometimes putting them in uncomfortable situations. For example, bringing one lady up in front of the group. She hated to be in front of a group. Yet by doing that once out of her comfort zone and then speaking into her. See, I believe people grow into the conversations that you create around them. And as you create those conversations, you literally are able to help them grow into that because they're going to borrow your belief until they have the belief of themselves, right? They believe in their own system, their own gift, because a lot of people have a gift. They just haven't opened it yet. As a leader, it's up to us to get them to open it. Do you have any questions that you consistently ask within these conversations that encourage deep thought within your team? 
Well, I think a leader's, uh, one of the leader's job is to help their people think at a higher level because people become like the people they hang out with. And who are the people surrounding themselves with? How are they thinking? For example, I had one lady that, uh, oh, she was always saying, oh, I'm just so devastated. I'm so devastated. I'm so depressed. I'm so whatever. And she would go on about what she was talking about. I said, what if you just said that either you're a bit annoyed or you're working through it? Oh, I'm working through this. And she goes, I like working through. I can, okay, let's use those words then. And can you even hear the difference? Oh, I'm devastated. I'm depressed about, or I'm working through whatever it is. It, it just changed her whole demeanor. It changed the way she looked at it and the way she spoke about it, which meant she had different values entering into her head. Now she had valued creativity. She was working through it, whereas before she valued complaining and being a victim or sometimes a villain by taking it out on other people, right? I, changing those words, she chose to become the hero of her own life. You're pumping me up. I love stuff like this. The little tweaks that you can do that completely shift your own mentality. But also I love them in conversations with other people because you could say the same message in a way that is received completely different. So whether it's your own mind or someone else's, you're speaking my language and I'm pumped up. And I just want to make sure we have time to go back though. Um, earlier, you mentioned a couple of MAPS coaching success stories. And I was wondering if you could mm -hmm. share one or two with us. Well, I think one of uh, a great one was Jeff Quinton. We talked about it. First of all, Jeff never missed a day of lead generation. Never. Nine to 11, he was on the phones calling every day, except for 9-11. And literally, his fiance at the time was calling his phone and calling his phone and he didn't want to answer it because he was lead generating. And all of a sudden he said, oh, okay, I'll call her back. Something's going on. And then she tells him about the World Trade Centers. Well, he's in New York, for heaven's sakes, but he doesn't have the television on. He's been calling. He has no idea what's going on. That was the only day he did not complete at least two hours of lead gen. And I know a lot of people don't like to, to make, uh, do phone calls and that. And he thought, what else can I do? So he had him go out and start interviewing restaurant owners. Of course, he chose restaurants that had a big clientele and he interviewed the people and started putting those things on YouTube and sending them out in his emails and sharing those videos with everyone. And then he asked the restaurant owners to share it with their people because it was a great interview. Little things like that that we came up with. And you know how he came up with that idea? was we had him put thinking time in his schedule. See, most people, they don't even want to take time to think. They're just doing, 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 right? Whereas three o'clock thinking time every day, pretty soon you're training your brain to start being creative as three o'clock rolls around. Well, what are you, what should you be thinking about? I mean, after all, the book Think and Grow Rich is exactly right. It's Think and grow rich, not do and grow rich, right? We also had, oh my goodness, uh, so many people. Rachel Adams, she does a lot with social media. In fact, she says has have 30 different hashtags that she's using at any given time so she can build carousels and funnels and things that when she even talks about them, I'm going, oh my gosh, that sounds like so much fun. And... Watching her, she got 131 referrals last year just from social media. And when you look at all these things, uh, Levi Lassick, he's doing YouTube videos about Dallas. Why would you move to Dallas and showing people different parts of Dallas? He found that on Google, people were not 
going to Google and saying, tell me more about Dallas, when they were thinking about moving there, they were going to YouTube searching. So he said, I'll provide the knowledge for them to literally be able to do that. Peter Shabri up in Ohio, well, you know what? He said, I'm going to start helping realtors and I'll just send out videos and emails and help them. That way I'll get referrals. Well, now it's a business for him. People absolutely subscribe for him to help them with real estate tips. And then, of course, uh, oh, goodness, uh, Laura Burns uh, with their, their um, open houses. They do three open houses in one week on the same home. And they knock 150 doors around the open house. They invite them to all three at the same time. And they will not give an answer to any contract. They'll take contracts, but they will not accept a contract until the eighth day. So they've had an entire week of open houses. The first open house, they just invite people to come by, look at the house. The second one, they invite them for margaritas and tacos, or they'll have an antique car show. They make events out of their open houses. Uh, they may have artists bring in uh, paintings that the artists even sell. They do a lot of different things. The third one is to come back and look at the house. And do you know, in 10 years they've been doing this, 85% of their listings sell in those first eight days. I mean, now if that doesn't excite you, I don't know what will. But these are all things that we came up with, they came up with a lot because we would ask questions. See, a good coach ask questions. A good coach helps you pull your gifts out. A good coach is always seeing before, seeing more, and helping you see it and believe in it. We've talked about so many good nuggets about, you know, attitude and mindset and values, your unconscious thinking patterns. You know, um, establishing thinking time for yourself. I, I'm curious about the business. So these are all amazing things that coaches can help you with. And you have taken, you know, you mentioned how you had one coach left in the beginning. And I was curious about how you scaled. So hypothetically, I'm, I have a business and I'm looking to scale. What are some steps or considerations that you would recommend when looking to scale a business? Well, first of all, think big. And then think bigger. One of the exercises I've had a lot of people do over the years is write down what you made last year. Let's just say it's a hundred thousand. And so Shelby, you write a hundred thousand per year because that's what you were making. And by the way, you were making that because of your financial thermostat that lives right here in your head, in your unconscious mind. Everybody has one. Whatever that financial thermostat is, if it's 100,000 and you start getting close to making 110, you'll sabotage those deals to stay at 100,000 or close to it. We do this to ourselves all the time. We want to be great and then we keep thinking mediocre thoughts or we don't know how we're thinking at all, right? Like I said, it's unconscious. So here's this financial thermostat set at 100,000 per year. So I have you write down 100,000. In fact, write it four more times underneath that first one. And when you do 100,000 a year, you cross through it. And the next 100,000, I want you to put per month. And you sit there. What happens in your brain? You go, woohoo, I love it. I'm going to have 100,000 per month, right? Well, that's okay. But then cross through it. What about 100,000 per week? That's when your brain probably starts going, oh, that's too far-fetched. I, I, I can't even imagine that. Well, somebody is out there making that kind of money. Why not you? 
Real quick, before we get back to the episode, two things I wanted to share. First, thank you so much for tuning in week after week. It really means the world to all of us. Second, we feel like we're just getting started. If you enjoy what we do here, please follow us on this app, share an episode, or give us a quick review. I promise we're working hard behind the scenes to make this show as good as possible now and into the future. Thanks guys, back to the show. I mean, literally. We all put our pants on the same way, right? We're all pretty much made the same way. Let's figure it out. How are they doing it? They're thinking differently than we are, but that isn't even enough. Instead of 100,000 a week, what about 100,000 a day? When I first, uh, Tony DeSello, who is now my husband, yet uh, we were in a mastermind group together. And this was way back in the day, in the 1990s. And I said, so let's go for a $100,000 a month. Let's just see if we can do it. Now, the average price of homes in my area were like one ninety seven, So it was like really far-fetched, yet we went for it. And of course, he hit it. He was up in Boulder. And his was like three hundred dollars to 400000 average sales price. He obviously hit it far more, uh, like three months before I ever did. But then when he did it and he started kind of bragging about it, I said, well, you know what? Why don't you have a $100,000 a day? And he goes, what? I said, a $100,000 a day. I said, you said at Mastermind you were going to be going with a, a bunch of your buddies to Lake Powell for seven days. I know you can't get cell phone coverage down there. So it's going to give you a lot of time to think while you're fishing. Just think about how you're going to do it. And he said it drove him crazy for that entire week. Yet he came back, he had a plan. I could sell one home for this price or two homes for this price, three homes for this price. And he started breaking it down. And lo and behold, out of nowhere, a buyer came that wanted to buy a three to $4 million home. So that was a good start. And he did close 99,992 dollars in one day and he would have made the 100,000 except for the guy that bought the 4 million dollar property well unfortunately he had it was in two lots and he had one close in December and one close in January so there you go yet is 100,000 dollars a day more than you can comprehend, well, cross it over. What, what about $100,000 an hour? There are people out there doing that. Why not us? It's because we're not thinking the same way. So who are we interviewing? I mean, you're interviewing me. You're interviewing many, many rock stars in real estate to help understand how people think. Yet it's We've got, I'm, I've said this over and over again, I'm going to keep saying it. We train our brains how to think. And where we're at right now, we have trained ourselves to think at that level. You know, behind me is a picture with Oprah Winfrey and myself. I always wanted to meet her. And I thought, how do I meet her? I don't know. I just kept saying, I'm going to meet her. I kept asking. There was a gentleman in Canada and a lady in LA finally said, I think I can make it happen. Now, I worked with them. I did make it happen. And not only for me, I took my sister and my daughter-in-law. We had a great time. In fact, one of the bold coaches had said she always wanted to meet Oprah, so I took her with me. And I said, guys, I'm going to talk to her first, and then you guys can all come in, right? <laughs> Just the way that woman thinks. She was asked to change her name to Susie because nobody would remember Oprah. Now, that's silly because everybody knows Oprah, right? Who do you want to meet? Think about the thought leaders you desire to be around. I mean, Gary Keller is a great thought leader. The Millionaire Real Estate Agent book is a fabulous book. And he went to top agents to find out what they were doing. And then he developed models. Notice models. And he always said, follow the model, right? So we had a great model to follow. And John Maxwell in leadership, go to some of the best, go to their events, be around them, 
We're having an event in March to raise money to buy books for kids on values around the world and uh, young adults to teach them leadership. Love to have you there. It's in Nashville. And uh, we're going to be having a lot of experiences and you're going to be around thought leaders. Uh, Shelby, do, do we realize there are five generations that we're working with right now? Five different generations, and they all think differently. And as realtors, we've got to know how those generational people think so we can absolutely help them in their real estate needs. Well, Tim Elmore is going to talk to us about how the different generations think and how you approach them. So I can get very passionate about certain things and go on for a long time, so I'm going to shut up about it yet. You need to be there March 25th and 26th. (laughs) <laughs> March 25th and 26th. Got it. Okay, Diana, what did we not cover today that you would like to cover before we hit, go into our wrap up? I think the biggest thing is what Blockbuster, Radio Shack, and Sears taught us. They didn't look at different. They just kept doing the same thing because it was working for them. And they didn't take thinking time. They didn't learn new ways. I don't know why they didn't become different. Why didn't Blockbuster buy Netflix when they had the opportunity to? When they said, oh, it was too non-traditional. Oh, it was too different than what the public wanted. They didn't realize when the consumer started changing, those five generations, the consumer started changing and they remained the same. So I think the biggest thing is what are you going to do different today than you did yesterday? Because right now, research says 6,000 to 60,000 thoughts a day. And I don't care which research you want to believe. It's a lot of thoughts. The problem is 90% of our thoughts, Shelby, are the same thoughts we had yesterday and the day before that and the day before that. And the worst part, is 85% of those thoughts are negative. 95% of our listeners right now want something more in their life. 5% by research will implement and do something about it. So I'm just glad that you're one of those 5%. And I just really invite (laughs) everyone that's listening to us, get the book, Becoming More. You can't get to better until you get to different. Take the assessment, work on your mindset, and become the person you've always wanted to be. Diana, I'd love to hear a little bit about the mentorship program that you're, you're starting. Well, I'm so excited about it because, after all, my passion comes through on a lot of things. But the biggest passion I have is adding value to people. In fact, Shelby, at 7 a.m., my phone goes off and it says, what will you do to add value to people? And at 7 p.m., it goes off and says, what did you do to add value to people? Well, it went off one evening and I started thinking, you know, since I stepped down from being CEO, I've been helping, going on a lot of mission trips, that kind of thing, doing a lot with John Maxwell and leadership. Yet, I wanted more. So I'm going to start mentoring some folks. Not a lot. I'm going to take on a few. It's going to be a group mentoring plus an individual. It'll be kind of a combination. I'm excited about it, though. Because, uh, well, mentoring means you've been around a while, you've learned a lot, and you want to share that with other people to help them. And who are you looking to mentor? Primarily people that want to step up and be more, do more, and have more, and potentially give more in their life. Leadership is one of the big things I believe in. Like I said, I don't care if you're selling real estate. If you have a team, you're a leader. If you're selling individually, you're a leader. You have to lead yourself. So I believe everyone must absolutely learn leadership lessons, leadership skills, and it is a skill. So it's primarily going to be focused on leadership. And of course, they can ask questions about anything that they desire. I'll be an open book, authentic, transparent. And Diana, people who are listening, who are like, I have to get more of Diana in my life, in my world, where's the best way they can find out more about you or, you know, get your book, all of the things. 
<laughs> well, they can go to Amazon and pre-order the book. They can also go to becomingmorebook.com, especially if they want to do bulk orders. And we have a, a book club in a box if they order so many, those types of things. Of course, I'm on Facebook, uh, Diana Kokoska, Instagram, Diana.Kokoska. And Diana is with two N's, right? D-I-A-N-N-A. Uh, of course, I'm on LinkedIn. And uh, just follow me. That's the best thing. Is, and I just give different ideas from the books, different ideas from realtors that I talk with, and a lot about leadership. Because after all, we all lead ourselves, if not others. Perfect. Diana, it has been so fun hanging out with you today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Shelby. You asked great questions and it's been my privilege. Thank you. Okay, Real Estate Rockstars, thanks for listening. In your life, you deserve to be more, be more, do more, have more, and give more. And now the Becoming More podcast with Diana Kokoska. I